So hi, everybody. In the next hour of Group by Paul Stanton is going to be talking about Docker containers and database clothes. So take it away, Paul. Okay, so uh, actually the tail end discussion with uh, Javier brings up a good point, which is, you know, putting the context of why are we talking about Docker containers and database cloning? Uh, I'm the co-founder at a company called Windocs. We took on the uh, unenviable position of delivering a alternative implementation of Docker on Windows. So as such, we're uh, trying to offer something of value that uh, competes with a built-in feature of Windows Server 2016. Uh, you may wonder why on earth we would choose to do that. I'm going to explain that in a few minutes. But uh, the whole notion of uh, containers and cloning, I think, is very important for uh, SQL Server DBAs to understand. Clearly, there's a big focus at Microsoft as well as really industry-wide. Uh, you can look at AWS, Google, and others. Uh, huge investments occurring with uh, container-based uh, technologies. Uh, you hear a lot about Kubernetes. You're going to hear a lot more about containers with SQL Server. And I think underlying all of this is that uh, SQL Server DBAs have an opportunity here to uh, automate the delivery of infrastructure through an application-driven workflow. I think that's going to be a trend that is going to be with us for years to come. Uh, it's really uh, central to... Uh, the topic here with uh, database cloning is all about the virtualization of uh, storage and the delivery of those database environments. Uh, containers with uh, database cloning do much of the same. Uh, the automation of the delivery of the application environments with data. Um, so I think it's a very relevant topic. Uh, obviously, uh, the audience voted the, this topic onto the list for today's session, so I'm really happy to be here. And uh, you'll find that containers also deliver beyond uh, VMs uh, economy and efficiency. Uh, people that use containers average three to five uh, times fewer VMs used in a dev text QA context. Uh, these container environments are delivered in seconds. They deliver a portable run anywhere type of an environment. So workloads can be moved from a dev machine to a shared uh, QA server and you know that they're going to run. Likewise, albeit not as commonly, people can move workloads from an on-premise environment to a cloud environment and know that it will run. Um, and cloning also is another very, very important aspect of a strategy here to bring SQL Server into a modern uh, continuous integration type environment, either with virtual machines or with containers, as we'll see. Um, and bottom line is, I just think that these two technologies, while they're two separate technologies, should be on the short list for things for DBAs to come up to speed on and for many organizations to pilot and evaluate. One of the things that I think is really important to understand is that uh, while containers and clones are extremely complementary, they also can be used individually. Um, Redgate SQL Clone is a product that delivers a Windows-based uh, database cloning. Uh, Windocs also has a similar design that runs on Windows. Uh, Microsoft is doing containers on Windows Server 2016 and Windows 10, uh, and Windocs does both. But con containers today, while they're a great solution for many people, are not for every project. Uh, one of the first things you should evaluate when you take a look at containers is uh, the fit for your uh, business uh, environment. Uh, on Windows containers today, uh, this is true for both Win Microsoft and Windows, uh, we don't have SQL agent support. We also do not have uh, support for SQL replication in Windows containers. SSRS and SSAS are not available today, although we're expecting to release uh, support on Windows soon. Uh, so containers are a great solution for many. Uh, they do not cover the complete gamut of the rich capabilities available with SQL Server. Uh, so in those cases, uh, the alternative solution or the complementary solution, if you will, is to use database cloning on a VM or a bare metal machines because there you have the full complete fidelity of the uh, SQL Server capabilities to leverage with uh, database cloning. 
So let's talk for a minute about uh, Windocs and the Microsoft Windows containers. There are some fundamental architectural differences that uh, do, uh, you know, yield some significant uh, differences between the two designs. Uh, on the left is the Microsoft design. It uh, conforms to the classic uh, Docker on Linux uh, design principles. And what you end up with is a container that combines uh, significant portions of the Windows operating system with the application environment running on a shared uh, operating system kernel. And on the right is the Windows design. Uh, we use Windows job objects for user and process isolation. And uh, the containers in this case really are just the application environment itself. We're running on a shared operating system as opposed to a shared kernel. And uh, that has uh, a number of interesting uh, results. Uh, the first and foremost is that this design allows us to deliver a Docker implementation that runs on Windows Server 2012. I opened up with the, the question on why on earth would you embark on a project like this? And we did it with a single reason. Uh, Server 2012 will continue to grow its share of the enterprise usage through the year 2020 or 2021. And uh, we'll have a long life beyond that. Uh, so this is a very large uh, market. Uh, so for a small company like us, uh, you know, addressing a portion of the market is more than adequate for us to be very successful. So we have embarked on this to provide the community uh, an on-ramp, if you will, for Docker containers on Server 2012. Now, interestingly, about half of our customers are running Windows on Server 2016. Uh, so they're clearly making a choice to run Windows rather than the built-in support offered by Microsoft. And there are really two main reasons for that. One is that uh, we support out of the box all versions of uh, SQL Server 2008 forward, all, all versions, all editions of that. Uh, and we also support Windows-based authentication. And this is one of the notable advantages that we've realized with our design by maintaining the classical Windows uh, application architecture, we maintain compatibility with existing enterprise infrastructure and including the Active Directory uh, security system. So we support Windows authentication, uh, Windows SQL Server containers support VSS and SQL Writer uh, based apps. We can integrate with host as well as SAN based storage systems. Uh, we support vast uh, range of uh, SQL Server configurations, be it database mail or uh, uh, transparent data encryption, extensible key management uh, systems, CLR assemblies, et cetera. As I mentioned earlier, we're uh, near release on SSRS and SSAS. Um, another thing that uh, this design does is it simplifies the maintenance of uh, the system. You know, We take a look at the system that Microsoft delivers Windows updates will require containers and their associated images to be rebuilt uh, simply because the Windows uh, operating system resides in the containers themselves. In the Windows design, Windows updates occur and do not affect your uh, SQL Server containers or images. So that's a brief but important uh, distinction to make between those two designs. So let's uh, shift gears and talk a little bit about uh, database cloning. Uh, and we refer to it as, as database cloning because we are, of course, focused on the SQL Server uh, community. But uh, the, the, the capabilities really uh, stem from uh, volume snapshots that have been available for years and years from companies like NetApp, Pure Storage, uh, Dell with their EqualLogic line, and others. Storage array systems have had the ability to do fast snapshots on uh, volumes uh, for the past decade or more. Uh, the Windows operating system has uh, not supported this fast uh, snapshotting capability, but it does offer a Windows Storage Management API. And just uh, as a matter of uh, coincidence, 
we and uh, Redgate both pursued a design of delivering database cloning at about the same time. I think we both released uh, last year in about the March or April timeframe. And uh, the Windows Storage Management API has been around for quite a while as well, uh, the past decade roughly, and is the underlying technology for Hyper-V VMs. So it's very robust, very capable technology and the design from Redgate and from Windows is essentially the same. And what we do is we take backups or snapshots and we build a uh, virtual hard drive, a VHD. Uh, the VHD in this case uh, could include uh, one database as uh, Redgate's product builds a VHD for each database being cloned. Uh, Windoc supports the ability to build a VHD that supports one database or perhaps 50 or more databases in a single VHD image. Uh, the virtual hard drive that is built is a full byte copy of the data environment. And uh, it becomes a read-only data source then for uh, differencing disks or clones. Uh, building the VHD can take a substantial period of time. We don't have the fast snapshot capabilities in the Windows file system that uh, Linux, or, well, or Unix systems have. Uh, but once you build that VHD, you can deliver clones from it to differencing disks in a matter of uh, 30 to 40 seconds. And these clones then expose the databases that are uh, present in the VHD, and those can be, then be mounted to either containers or SQL Server instances as the uh, customers choose. Um, as I mentioned, the, the virtual hard drive is a full byte copy. Uh, the initial creation time will take uh, whatever time is normally associated with a full backup and restore process. Uh, Ultimately, when we have SQL log shipping support, uh, slides badly out of date, um, you know, it'll be a fairly fast process. Uh, the clones that are delivered from these are delivered quickly, and that's irrespective of the size of the uh, parent VHD. If that parent VHD is two terabytes, it'll take about 30 seconds, just as it would even if that parent VHD is sent 10 gigabytes. The uh, differencing disks that are delivered are small. They're 40 megabytes or less in size, but they do expand using a copy on write design. So as uh, users make changes to the uh, differencing disk, data will be copied down from the VHD to that differencing disk environment uh, using a copy on write uh, methodology. So let's uh, talk briefly about uh, how database cloning and Docker containers uh, come together into a workflow. And I want to walk through uh, the steps here. This will help uh, illustrate the workflow that we're going to take a look at uh, briefly as we switch to a uh, live demo. And here what we have is on the left is a, a Docker host. Um, Conceptually, that could be a, uh, a Microsoft Windows 2016 server. Uh, in this case, we're going to talk about a workflow that is specific to Windows, but the concepts here of how these two technologies come together, I think, is very relevant for this discussion. So you've got a container engine on the left. It would be a, typically a Windows Server 2012 or 2016. On the lower right, uh, you can imagine yourself being uh, working on a client, and we're going to build a SQL Server image that is includes uh, database cloning. And we would do so by building, uh, using a Docker command, docker build minus T, a Docker file. A Docker file is a simple plain text configuration file that defines a uh, image. So we're going to build an image today, and uh, this image uh, is comprised of two full backups. Uh, you can see uh, below the Docker file, the context uh, specifies from MS SQL 2016. Every Docker file begins with a from statement that simply defines what is the base image I'm going to work with. And in this case, we're going to restore two full backups, sales and ops. 
And you'll notice that the backups in this case are located on a network attached file share, uh, the test uh, back uh, DB backups share. And so we've got full uh, sales and ops. And then we're going to copy and run a SQL Server script as well. Now that context gets sent to the container engine and uh, the uh, commands involved in that configuration are processed serially. So the first thing it will do is it will build that ser uh, SQL Server 2016 container. And then it will build a VHD. The VHD is going to be built in the first location specified in the Docker file. So it's going to be built in the test machine DB backups folder. And once that is built, then the uh, backups are restored to it. Uh, so that VHD becomes a full byte copy of that environment. And when the backups are restored, the scripts are run. And when those are complete, the VHD is actually unmounted and saved as part of the image. And that is your integrated workflow of uh, containers with database cloning. Once the image is built, then you can serve up environments on demand. Uh, and as I mentioned, a terabyte class database environment, whether it's one database or 40 databases, is delivered in about uh, 45 seconds. And uh, the command from a user's perspective is a very simple docker run minus D and the image name. Uh, docker today is a very command line centric tool, although I'm going to show you some uh, new work that we're doing with the web UI. So we would run that command and the container engine would uh, pull the details of what, what's defined by this image called clone. And it would see that the first thing it needs to do is build that SQL Server 2016 container. And then it would go out to that uh, share location where the VHD is uh, located. And it would clone it, uh, create the differencing disk or the clone that includes the databases defined, uh, the sales and ops database. And those would be mounted to the container. And then the results are returned to the client. So you've got now a container which is uh, installed on the host with the differencing disk uh, mounted to it with the databases. And uh, that is a complete read-write supporting environment for the user. I'm going to pause here. What, uh, you guys have any uh, questions at this point? Yeah, no, I don't want to see questions on on both the uh, Golden Webinar and the, the uh, Group by Slack channel, so you can go ahead. All right. Okay, so we've got to uh, an environment here I've remoted into our lab where we're running a system. I'm going to show you, uh, this is a sample Docker file. So this would be a configuration file that a DBA would define to create an image. So in this case, what we're doing is we're building an image that is using SQL Server 2014. You can work with any of the SQL Server products from SQL 2008 forward, including 2017 and all the various uh, uh, editions. So in this case, you can see we're, we're actually building a, what I would call a complex image. It is one, two, three, four, five different databases. In this case, the databases are local to the host. Um, they can be local on the host. They also can be on a network attached file share. If we were working on a network attached file share, we'd be using universal network paths instead of uh, the references that we're working with here. And you can see that we're also running, copying and running a script on this. So these are relatively small databases, so this won't take long, but I'll just go ahead and uh, show you the So what I'm doing is I'm going to build this environment. I'm going to name the uh, name the image new complex clone. And now I'm simply going to type the path to that 
that uh, that uh, Docker file. So as I showed you on the PowerPoint slide, the building of a image is going to use the uh, Docker file, a configuration file. The context of that file then is displayed on the client. And this process will go uh, fairly quickly because these uh, database backups are small. Uh, and I want to use small backups because this is the, the time consuming part of this operation. You know, if you're working with large database environments, this is something that you'd want to schedule to run, you know, after hours typically to uh, create an updated environment that uh, people could use that following day. Now we we're beginning. have a question on, on the Slack channel. So VRL is asking, how is the read-write performance compared with a full-blown VM? Uh, compared to a VM, it's not going to be any different. You know, the database cloning, whether you're running a container or running a VM, uh, it's going to be virtually the same. You know, the and it's very... Uh, you know, I, I've got customers that are running 30 or 40 container instances on a large VM configuration. Um, they love it. Uh, oftentimes, developers will uh, report that they actually find the performance better than what they've had on local workstation environments. Uh, but with that said, for I also have customers that will run a relatively small container count. Uh, for compute-intensive uh, ETL jobs, you know, so it will vary, and you have to use an environment that's suited for your uh, needs. But whether it's a VM or whether it's a container, you won't see any difference in performance. The container overhead is very low. If just and to finish the point here, obviously. If you're running a single instance on a VM and you go to another environment where you have 10 containers running, you know, you have logically about 10x the workload. So, you know, but for a given given environment, be it a container or a VM, it's not going to be any different. Okay, so the, the uh, image is now built and using uh, the Docker UI, Whoops, I'm going to give away my uh, new stuff here. Um, you can see the new complex clone image is built. So let's just uh, complete this uh, by, let's do a run minus D. Uh, I'm going I'm to define a port. 10,075. Let's also define a SA password. If I could type, I would be doing better. <laughs> and uh, so what I'm doing here is oftentimes, you know, developers in particular will want to work with a fixed. A connection string. If they're working with Java or a .NET app, uh, they'll want to be able to provision a SQL Server environment at a known port and with a known uh, credential. This is one way to do it. I'm going to show you uh, some other ways shortly. So Docker run minus T, I've divine, defined a port at 10,075. I've defined an SA password. And uh, so now let's just call up the uh, image that we want. And now this will give us a running environment. Now in the space of 40 seconds, we're going to have a new uh, SQL, in this case, SQL 2014 instance installed on the host. It just happens to be a, a named instance that is uh, delivered using the Docker uh, commands and APIs. But it's a full named instance on the host albeit it's not one that works with SQL Agent today. <laughs> um, 
and then we'll be able to uh, pull up uh, SQL Server Management Studio. Let's do that. One thing that uh, as working since we're working with a named instance, we'll be using a loopback address here locally. And I provision that uh, SA, so I'll use that. I can also use the Windows authentication. I can see that the uh, it completed here, and so there it is. You know, so I've just delivered a, a fairly complex environment, uh, five databases in this case, but we have customers that customers that really love this, or customers that have large complex uh, environments. You know, if you have twenty or thirty or forty databases. Uh, there's a lot of efficiency that is to be gained here. And uh, so that's a real simple illustration of the process that people go through to build a SQL Server environment in the form of an image, uh, and then to create uh, containers that include the data. And now you can imagine that at this point, uh, you know, it, albeit this is a command line driven interface, uh, your developers in QA uh, may push back on that, but you've got the ability now to automate the delivery of environments for users. Uh, you can obviously work with PowerShell, uh, the Docker commands are all here, and this is how Docker works. Now, one of the things that I was up late last night working on is, uh, not too surprisingly, you know, customers are saying, hey, um, you know, give us a solution where uh, we don't have to do everything through a command line. You know, so we're, we've had a web UI available for some time, um, and we're augmenting that now, as I'm gonna show you in a minute here. So what you have is the ability to expose uh, images. You can actually uh, browse and select the files for the Docker files in the build here through the web UI, so we wouldn't have to necessarily even use the command line to build the image that we just built. Uh, you can see that the image is available here, and you can see I've got a number of uh, data environments down below. Now, what what we're very excited about and what really is new here today and uh, please uh, cross your fingers and hope that this works, it should, uh, is this ability to take the data environments and say, look, we want to support the delivery of these environments to whatever uh, target environment that you choose. So obviously we have on this host that we're running here locally, this is a Windows Server 2016 with Windox installed, so we are delivering uh, SQL Server containers here locally. We also have on the LAN uh, 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 Windows Server 2016 running Microsoft SQL Server containers, but we also have a, a host to that has just got a SQL Server instance on it. And uh, this image that we've just looked at has a number of databases. So what we're exposing is giving users the option. You can say, look, we you can have have them all, or you can have a subset of the uh, databases. And all you have to do is enter the machine name and instance name that you're targeting. So in this case, on my LAN is Acer Test 2 SQL 2014, and I'm using an SA. Uh, user and SA password to affect the delivery. So let's give it a try. And so what's happening now is we're creating that differencing disk that we've already created on the Windows host, the new complex clone. We've selected these three databases and we're going to create the differencing disk and now we're gonna point and we're gonna mount these three databases to this uh, target environment on the LAN. In this case, uh, the Acer Test 2 environment. And uh, 
This looks promising. And this takes uh, a bit less than a minute or roughly about a minute to get uh, get done. All right, guys, any uh, further questions at this point? If there aren't any on, questions, yeah. on Slack or going. on Twitter, but uh, I have a couple of questions. So it looks here like um, your for each image you can create one clone, is that right? Or can you create multiple clones from the same one through here? Oh, yeah, you can create as many instances, as many clones as you choose. It's unlimited. That's really cool. Yeah. yeah so it's, it's functionally very much like uh, uh, Redgate SQL clone. Um, so here's the environment that we just targeted. So the Acer Test 2 machine. You can see I mounted operations was mounted previously. So let's refresh this. And here's the moment of truth. Bummer. <laughs> Demo gods. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. That is a bummer. Let me see here. Yeah. Bummer. Okay. Well, that is how the world rolls. But that, you know, what we should have seen, obviously, is we should have seen another instance of test operations not at show up on that host. And uh, now I've got uh, a basis for complaint with my devs. They'll hear from <laughs> me later today. Anyway, but this has been working. I don't know why this isn't working right now, but we're... So what... what you know, so what we're doing here is we're like SQL clone does today, Alex. I'm sure you're familiar. Uh, you, you can clone in an individual database and using a, a client or an agent, you can get that mounted to an instance. So what we're doing here is we're a little bit of a different approach. The image itself can be one database or it could be 30 or 40 databases. And we can deliver either the complete environment or a subset of that environment, depending on what the user wants to do. And uh, we do that uh, using SQL cred uh, SA credentials from the host, using SQL command and a few other things. So, you know, what we've got here is the ability to, you know, our vision is for Windows, we want to source data anywhere, you know, in the enterprise. Uh, so we've we work today with uh, storage companies like uh, Pure Storage, NetApp, uh, Equalogic, Sans. We've got customers asking us for support from companies like Rubrik. These are storage arrays and storage appliances that are sitting in the uh, data center. Uh, we have the, the design to uh, expose their data environments through a Docker-based image. And then we're going to give customers the option to say, look, you know, you can use these data environments wherever you choose. And this management server is going to get built out so that we have user group uh, role, roles and authentication, uh, job scheduling support, and obviously all the, the ease of use that we've seen here, albeit uh, it'll be functional as opposed to uh, clicking on buttons and not having the data arrive. But uh, that's the vision, is source data from any source, deliver it to any uh, legitimate target on the LAN, and uh, rock and roll. And you know, so this goes back to what I said earlier. Really what this is about is providing tools to the SQL Server DBAs, really gonna be doing a lot of uh, automation of the underlying infrastructure. I really think that a lot of what we think of as the cloud today is uh, automating infrastructure, and that is moving up the stack to being an application-driven automation framework. And that's a lot of what Docker is about. That's really what uh, database cloning is about. It's really putting these, automating the underlying infrastructure uh, from a SQL Server DBA.
Uh, don't you hate it when you say we don't have any questions and all of a sudden somebody pops a question? So Carmen has a question here. Oh. Are these containers in clones updatable with new data from sources or do they have to rebuild everything from scratch given the minimum amount of time required for refresh build? Yeah, it's a great question. Today, you uh, we, we support uh, full and differential backups. And of course, the, the raw database files themselves, of course, uh, in the future, we hope to support SQL log shipping. Alex, I think the uh, Redgate SQL clone does the same, am I right? Uh, yes, I believe there is something similar in there. Um, the, uh, there's an ability to, um, most people I think will just create a fresh one kind of each night or something uh, in yeah. terms of actually having it live updating. I'm not, I'm not sure Redgate have anything like that. No, and, and we don't either. Uh, the best we support today is the ability to update an image with uh, differential backups. I'll uh, show you that process here. Um, and, you know, and this is a really good question because what you get with a, albeit, you know, the SANS, uh, Peer Storage or NetApp and others, you're looking at some pretty serious uh, capital outlay, you know, $100,000, $500,000 for these uh, all-flash storage arrays. Um, what you get with those is you get the ability to basically update a snapshot of volume in a matter of seconds. We don't have that ability with uh, the Windows-based file system. Um, but, uh, you know, it's... It, it is frankly a bit more rudimentary. It's not that big an issue, though, is it really? Because you you just like most people are going to be running a nightly backup anyway, and so that can be a great opportunity to test your restore. Apart from anything else, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, there are we do have uh, customers that say they have to have um, immediate availability of up to date images. And, you know, that's just not possible with uh, the Windows file system today. Uh, we can get closer to it in the future if we can support uh, SQL log shipping. But today we're limited to full and differential backups. So the frequency of image updates will be limited. So here I've got um, a Docker file. Well, let's take a quick look at the images that we have available. So. We have a complex clone and we have the new complex clone. So to uh, I'm not going to be able to uh, do this. I, my login that I'm using won't allow me to save the silly file. But what 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 I could illustrate is, you know, if I I could do a Docker build minus T and I could create a differential update on the complex clone, you know, and I would just run that Docker file. Now I'm not I'm not actually going to run this command because the issue I've just realized is in my setup here, I don't have the simple ability on my host here to update this file. See, it's referring to a full clone image. I don't have a full clone image on the system. The images I've got are called complex and new complex. So what I to run this file, I would have to update this, for example. And if I could save the file with this change, I could run it and we could have a differential update to an image. But that's the process that we have today uh, with, you know, this Windows-based uh, cloning. Uh, so it's not going to be up to date in terms of the, the last hour necessarily. It could be up to date, you know, to perhaps the latest 12-hour differential update, but that's as good as you're going to get today. What other uh, questions do we have? I'm going to say we don't have anything because the minute I say we don't have anything, somebody pops up and asks questions. So right now we don't have anything. I don't know. Well, in the meantime, I'll ask a question. 
Um, sure. So um, this tool make, looks like it makes it really, really easy to spin up databases um, all over the place uh, with all sorts of data. Um, uh, so what are your, what's your advice about how to handle data privacy and so on in those scenarios, um, if we're talking about production backups and uh, yeah, databases yeah, and so on? Yeah, that's a great question, Alex. Thanks for bringing it up. And you're uh, being in uh, the UK, you've got a greater sensitivity to some of the regulatory requirements that are uh, uh, coming. Uh, GDPR is uh, foremost among them. And if you look at the, uh, the process that we're talking about here, in building an image, you know, we, you know, we're typically going to target a, a specific SQL Server environment. The, the environments are comprised of one or multiple databases. But uh, the nice thing is, and this is true for both Redgate SQL Clone as well as Windocs, we have the ability to uh, run SQL scripts during the image build. And, you know, this is critically important because, you know, our customers are typically applying scripts to address user and group permissions. Uh, scripts can be used, obviously, to implement data masking. Uh, the scripts are being used to implement uh, encryption and other SQL Server configuration requirements into the uh, data image. And if this is properly done, uh, the use of uh, these clone images should dramatically improve the regulatory compliance profile of uh, the organizations that use this. And I say that because today, you know, what we have in most organizations is we have what I would call uh, data sprawl. You've got backups being copied hither and yon throughout the organization. You've got a lot of ad hoc data restores happening. And I think from a regulatory compliance, from a data governance perspective, uh, you know, a chief data officer is going to want the ability to have auditable artifacts. And that's what you get here in this process. You end up with, uh, you know, a very distinct set of uh, images. They all are immutable artifacts. Once you create this uh, image, the new complex clone, it is immutable. You know, that is not going to change until you create a new updated image. Uh, so they're date time stamped, they're immutable, they're auditable, uh, and they can be, you know, regularly reviewed to see if the organization is adhering to the data policies that uh, the various groups have. So I've got customers that are using this workflow to create uh, literally a catalog of data for the, all the various users and groups within their enterprise. Um, got a customer that runs production on SQL Azure and takes backups from there, drops them down to a VM, and then creates a catalog of uh, data images that are tailored for the various users. So, you know, the images provided for development and test and QA reflect a certain set of users and group permissions, certain data policies, but customer support, uh, finance, uh, analytics and BI reporting, they get different images that reflect their various data policies. Uh, so the notion of creating, you know, these images, and I think the design between Windocs and Redgate SQL Clone both deliver on this, uh, support, you know, secure, auditable um, images, you know, so a very important aspect of this design, I think. We've got a follow-up question. Uh, good answer, by the way, very good answer. <laughs> Uh, we've got a follow-up question, and I'm going to mispronounce the name, and I apologize. It's from Vioral, I think, um, on Slack. Uh, she's asked if it's possible to run a PowerShell script instead of a SQL script. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that, um, yeah, we've got PowerShell scripting within the container as well as uh, obviously running uh, SQL commands. Uh, it's all automatable either way. Great.
Okay. Well, that's the, I guess I must have been excited because I rambled through on this fairly quickly, but that's our 45-minute session uh, for an hour-long block, but uh, we can cut everyone loose early and uh, call it a wrap. But there I, we go. I, I, and I think the, you know, the one thing I would say is, look, any organization that's working with uh, teams that require environments for dev test QA as well as reporting, if you're working with data that's over a gigabyte in size, you should look at SQL cloning. Now, if you're an organization that's working with databases that are over 50 gigabytes in size, you should buy a SQL cloning solution. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just be really direct. I mean, the cloning is such a value add and saves you on storage, gets you into a better, far better position for data compliance. Um, I could just unreservedly recommend it. And I would also recommend organizations that want to modernize, uh, you know, if, if DevOps and digital transformation are important, then I unreservedly recommend that, uh, you know, containers plus cloning should be on the list of uh, strategies to be evaluated. And with that, I'll uh, call it a wrap. <laughs> Well, thanks, Paul. Thanks very much for doing the presentation today at Group by. Thanks, Alex and Edwin, for hanging out and doing our questions and answers. And we will see you all at the next Group by. Adios, everybody.